This is what America's thinking for Friday, May 10th. I'm Jamal Simmons, and we're here to give you the latest news on public opinion before you head out to a big weekend. Welcome to our show. First up, gun control is no doubt one of the most divisive issues facing our country. If Congress is unable to reach an agreement on gun control, do you support a U.S. president issuing executive orders to regulate firearm sales? Or is this an issue that should only be tackled by Congress? We'll find out with the help of our exclusive Daily Hill Harris X poll. And later, to understand the future, you need to know the past. We'll discuss what Democrats may have learned from 2016 and what that means for 2020. All this is coming up right here. Welcome back to the show. Joining us today is Haley Soifer, who is the executive director of the Jewish Democratic Council of America. And her first appearance on our show, Malika Jabali, co-chair of Operation Power. Unfortunately, it's become an all too common occurrence. A school shooting happens, students die, politicians and media offer their thoughts and their prayers, but then things drift back to where they were before. Communities are left wondering why the tragedy happened and why the response is so tepid. Those questions are being asked in Charlotte, North Carolina, and in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, after school shootings there in the past 10 days. But this week, a 2020 presidential hopeful is trying to change that formula. Democrat Cory Booker proposed what some are calling a bold plan to address gun violence that calls for federal licensing and completion of a gun safety course. So we took on the gun issue ourselves at our Hill Harris X poll. We specifically asked about government involvement in gun sales. Do you favor a U.S. president issuing executive orders to regulate firearm sales if Congress can't agree on something? Or should it be the sole responsibility of Congress? By a 14-point margin, we found that folks wanted left to Congress. And in fact, almost as many people said they were unsure or don't know, as said the president should issue executive orders. Now, a couple of points. Half the Democrats in our polls say leave it to Congress, even though a handful of Democrats running for president have proposed executive orders if they became president. And Republicans were split over whether it should be a presidential or a congressional prerogative. Now, some might have interpreted that the question was about President Trump as opposed to any potential president. That might explain why there were a lot of Dems who said no, they didn't want Trump to have that authority. So with that out of the way, the Democrats have always led with having to fight the NRA to affect any gun law changes. But might the landscape be a little different now? Um, I'm actually going to start with you on this question, Haley. Um, what do you think about this gun question here? Well, I think that the American people want someone to do something, and it's clear that Congress has abdicated its responsibility. So the fact that we even have to ask this question is important to consider because we have an epidemic now of gun violence, and it's not just in our schools, it's also in our places of worship. The Jewish community especially is still reeling from the pain of a second synagogue shooting in just six months, and other communities, of course, have been affected as well. So we I went know. To a, on that note, I went to a bar mitzvah about a week ago, and I was surprised walking into the synagogue. They had metal detectors there uh, for everybody coming in to get wanded on the way into a religious service. Absolutely. I go so through, the kind of thing that happens in a nightclub or something. I same thing, but, taking yeah. my kids to Sunday school. Uh, and the reason that we need increased protection at our places of worship is because of the increase of white supremacy. It was a white supremacist who stormed the Pittsburgh synagogue and recently the Poway synagogue with an AR-15. Somebody has to do something about the guns and separately about the rise of hate. But on the guns, you know, the House actually did pass background check legislation for the first time in over 24 years. It's not going to pass because the president won't sign it into law and the Senate won't pass it. So I think the fact that we have to ask the question is revealing. And yes, people are confused. Is, is it about President Trump? They know President Trump is going to do something about this. So that may have led to some of the confusion in terms of your results. But somebody has to do something. And if it's not Congress, it should be the president. Malika, we also saw this obviously in Charleston a few years ago in South Carolina where uh, Dylan Roof walked in and, and murdered people who were worshiping. Um, this seems to be the kind of thing that is happening all over America. The question though is what do we do about it? And whether or not it's the president's job, Congress's job, or is there someplace else 
at, at maybe even at the state level that some of these things can be handled. Absolutely. Um, I'm just going to echo what Haley said. She covered it perfectly in terms of the fundamental problem. And I think the difficulty is figuring out a solution when you have, you know, a bipartisan legislature. I work in the New York City Council, and so it's, you know, it's a unified body, so it's easier to get things passed. So I think there's also a larger question of what do we do about the Senate when it is not representative of, you know, the American population. It's predominantly white men who are overrepresented in this. And many of them are Republicans who are going to block any sort of, uh, you know, massive radical legislation on regulating, you know, gun sales or having background checks. And the methodology, as you know, you mentioned, one of the issues is people are going to be partisan about this. So I don't even know if Repu Republicans would be interested in whether it's an executive order or if it's Congress. Maybe they are confused because they don't want any type of, you know, gun legislation. I mean, you know, here's a, here's the challenge for me: is on one hand, you know, I believe in kind of this con in, in this constitutional republic, and laws should emanate from Congress. The president should sign them. I don't want a president who's doing everything by fiat or executive order. I want them to go through a legislative process. The problem is when you have something like guns, an issue like guns, where you get vast majorities of the American people who can agree on common sense gun safety questions. But you cannot get the Republicans in Congress, and it's, I'm going to say it's partisan because it's the Republicans in Congress who are unwilling to sign up for any sort of gun safety question. I mean, there, there was a question just even about whether or not terrorists should be allowed to be able to purchase guns. If they're on the terrorist watch list, they can't get, we can't even get legislation to pass that. At some point, something's got to break here, right? Absolutely, and, and I think, you know, the fact that, um, that the answers might have been a bit skewed just shows that you can't remove a poll or a polling question from the political context. People know we have a crisis, and they know Congress isn't going to do something about it. The, uh, Congress has abdicated its responsibility for over two decades on this issue. So in the absence of Congress taking action, which constitutionally it should, Yes, people will look to the president. That's why candidates such as Kamala Harris have said they'd support executive orders. It's not that they want to empower necessarily President Trump. Yeah. It's just in the absence of congressional action, the executive branch will have to do something. Someone has to secure our schools and our places of worship and the other places that have been affected by this epidemic. I was at a, a AARP conversation about a, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the question came up about what people in the AARP generation and membership could do uh, to help the political process. And uh, the point I made to them is I think particularly with millennials and people who are younger, there is a feeling I have heard uh, that they feel as if people who are older than them are not taking the hard choices to make the world better for young people. That is true with climate change, and it's true with gun safety. You hear the, particularly the, the, the kids from Parkland who have been so incredibly outspoken around this issue. Um, imagine if you got the, the, the lobbying and economic might of AARP behind making common sense gun safety changes. You might actually see something change. Yeah, it's, it's possible, and I mean, you see these generational shifts, as, as you said, in a variety of areas, whether it's Medicare for all, whether it's, you know, free college tuition, a lot of these progressive issues, including, you know, gun safety, which should be kind of a, a bipartisan <laughs> um, common sense measure, it's going to have some sort of disparities between generations, and I mean, they're some of these, I guess, Generation Y or Z at this point, they even make millennials look bad because yeah. they're a lot more outspoken about these issues. And we've just become so accustomed to this being the way things are. And I think with kind of recent, you know, progressive wins, we're learning that they don't have to follow the status quo. But how do we get there is going to be another question. You know, I do have to say this before we take it off this topic. I grew up in Detroit in the 1980s, and I remember when people were getting shot outside of schools, people were getting shot at nightclubs. There's been violence against young people for a long time. The violence, the, the, the national concern about youth violence and guns happened when white kids started getting shot in the suburbs. And so um, this question about what we do about this, I'm glad there's more political import. I would not have predicted, though, that with children, I mean, kindergartners being killed, that you still couldn't get the United States Congress to do anything. And one of the few times that we've seen President Barack Obama show emotion in his political life were the day he had to get up and talk about these children who were being killed, kindergartners in America, and how we couldn't get the Congress to pass a law 
to help make them safer. So um, something, something has got to change. It has a partisan context, but this is not a partisan issue. This is about Americans being safe and protecting the country and protecting Americans. Still ahead, what lessons have Democrats learned from 2016 to get ready for 2020? We'll find out next on What America's Thinking. If you watched our previous segment, you know it was pretty deep and it got a little bit uh, emotionally wrought. But we're going to now talk about something that everybody can agree on, presidential politics, right? We all agree on that. We talked a lot on this show about President Trump's approval ratings nationally and in individual states. We've also looked at some of the emerging contours of his 2020 election strategy. Here's a spoiler alert. It's not that different from what he did in 2016. But what about the Democrats? What are they going to do in 2020? You might think it's a bit premature, but ever since Joe Biden jumped into the race with a big lead over the other candidates, he's essentially been running a general election campaign. And so far, it's working. But before we get into that, let's talk for a second about 2016. There's a lot of data out there on the topic, but it seems that Clinton lost the election, Hillary Clinton lost the election, for a couple of reasons. One, a lot of Democrats stayed home or voted third party rather than voted for her. Two, some people who voted for Obama switched to Trump. There's been a lot of discussion about Trump and the white working class, but it's worth pointing out that several studies have found that President Trump actually did better among minority voters than his GOP predecessor, Mitt Romney. However, according to Reuters Ipsos data, Trump won with a smaller percentage of minority votes than any president in decades. The Clinton drop-off of minority votes is more evident when you factor in third-party voting. In a Center for American Progress study, black support for Democrats dropped six points from 94% in 2012 to 88% in 2016, which is about what John Kerry got in 2004. Latino support dropped for four points from 69 to 65%. They also found Democrats lost six points among white voters without a college degree. The biggest shift between 2012 and 2016, however, seems to have been among people who made less money. In effect, in, ex excuse me, in exit poll data, people in households making less than $30,000 a year shifted 16 points toward the GOP, while those earning between $30,000 and $50,000 a year shifted six points. So, Haley, have you looked at this 2016 data and what do you think about these shifts? You were involved in yes. that last campaign. Yes, uh, yeah, we've looked at the data and I'll just say out of every faith community, uh, the Jewish community has overwhelmingly rejected Trump uh, consistently, <laughs> 16 and 18, and we'll do so again in 2020. Although all the, all the, all the pundits, I should all the pundits, there are a lot of pundits who are saying that President Trump is making these inroads in the Jewish community and you might see him uh, pick up a few points because of his close relationship with Bibi Netanyahu. So it's actually President Trump who started that narrative, and it's patently <laughs> false because all the evidence has shown that actually the Republican Party has lost support from Jews since he's been president. It's been halved if you look at 2014 compared to 2018. So they have they they should be concerned. Okay. Uh, I am not concerned about the Jewish community continuing to support Democrats, but I think in terms of President Trump's appeal to lower income voters, you know, this was based on kind of empty promises and lies, uh, that jobs were coming back, that factories were reopening, that the coal industry would be revitalized, that somehow these protectionist trade policies were going to help the American consumer. We haven't seen any of that play out in reality. Uh, and he's also used hate to divide uh, Americans and to mobilize certain bases. I'm going to stay with you for one second before I get Malika in here. What responsibility would you say the Clinton uh, candidacy had for her loss? I think the message was confusing. You know, sometimes the message in terms of I'm bringing your job back or whatever it was that Trump was saying did have a certain simplicity to it that resonated with his voters, perhaps more than the complexity of her policy mm -hmm. heavy message with her voters. Uh, she also didn't go everywhere she should have in the Midwest. I'm from Michigan. When I went back to Michigan in November of 16 and tried to understand why she had lost there, so close, but it, she, she lost. People were really uh, were upset that she hadn't come to the Midwest. Same with Wisconsin. Um, so you know, again, it's the complexity. But Democrats yeah. have learned from that. And if you looked at the discipline that we had in 18 in terms of our message on health care and every single candidate focusing on health care and access to affordable health care, you saw somewhat of a course correction. The message has gotten simpler. Malika, 
What do you see when you look at these voter numbers? Did, was there a, a flock of minority voters running for Donald Trump? I think, I mean, if that's what the data is saying, then that is what it's saying. And we did see that among some African-American men, not necessarily the same for African-American women. At the same time, what those, what that data is not going to be covering is the extent of non-voters who did not participate in the, in the election. Mm. So going to kind of your previous point, I don't know if this election was so much as a vote for Trump as it was a vote against Hillary Clinton and the Democratic establishment. You mentioned Wisconsin and the Midwest. In Wisconsin, it was the lowest black voter turnout in its recorded history. So it dropped from about 78% in 2012 for Barack Obama to 47%, almost dropped in half. To imagine that you have fewer than, than half of the black voters in your state who are coming out for an election, you have to ask the questions why. Of course, voter suppression is always going to be an issue in every election where there are black people involved because historically we have had our votes suppressed. Um, we're even seeing now kind of this felony disenfranchisement and people are not interested in enfranchising uh, fel uh, people who've been convicted of a felony. But at the same time, you have a lot of people who felt disaffected. And speaking to Hillary Clinton's ground game is, is another issue. So if you compare kind of her work to Barack Obama, she didn't show up, which is OK. That's like one, one instance where she could have gone there after you know, losing the primary to Bernie Sanders. But on top of that, she had 40 campaign offices compared to 69 for Barack Obama in 2012. Yeah. She had four campaign offices in Milwaukee County compared to 10, uh, as Barack Obama did. So not only did there was There yes. was a real disconnect, I think. Um, I think what the Clinton campaign did that was, that was interesting was they learned all the digital lessons of the Obama campaign, and they forgot all the ground game lessons of the Obama campaign. I shouldn't say yeah. all. But what you saw is a disconnect between the two. I think Obama figured out how to marry up those two strategies, and Hillary Clinton seemed to lean more on the digital strategy than on the face-to-face, person-to-person contact. If you look at a place like Michigan, uh, we just looked at Michigan, the Clinton campaign lost by 10,000 votes, maybe almost 11,000. Um, but the city of Detroit was down 50,000 votes. Right? So there were 50,000 missing voters from the city of Detroit. So if she had gotten half that number, maybe you know, thir a third of that number back out, Hillary Clinton may have won, right. may have won that state. Um, it's just interesting because there's a big debate happening in the Democratic Party right now about how much to focus on uh, Obama-Trump switchers versus uh, no Clinton stay home or third party voters. And if you take a look at that, what do you see in terms of the balance between talking to those two different groups of people? Well, I think it's probably best to focus on those who didn't vote and sending a message of, you know, this cost Hillary Clinton the presidency. They handed Donald Trump the presidency by not voting. And some of them were and young white kids in particular absolutely. who were who were really involved in the Bernie Sanders campaign and just never bonded back with Hillary Clinton in the and fall. And part of it also is because the polling consistently showed her ahead. I think people took for granted the fact that they that she would win and perhaps didn't think their vote would matter. But now we know just how much it mattered. And again, we did see a bit of a course correction in 18 on this because the younger vote, 18 to 24 year olds was up by 10 percent in the 2018 midterm compared to the 2014 midterm so that sends that shows that younger voters understand their vote matters and I think it also bodes well in terms of what might happen in 2020 it's harder to convince people who may have supported Donald Trump in 2016 to go vote against him in 2020 but right. there's an argument to be made there too <laughs> sure and in a state like Pennsylvania that's probably true because the numbers were so much bigger there was a huge surge in voters in Pennsylvania, um, and yet you saw Hillary Clinton get fewer voters than Barack Obama, Barack Obama in the end. Um, but you did see, I think it's something like 150, maybe 160,000 voters who went to a third-party candidate in that state. Um, so there's some real, uh, there's some real concern, I think, about holding for if you're a Democrat about holding on to Democratic votes. And the question is, of the candidates that you see who are running now. Um, are there candidates running who you think can both hold on to the Democratic vote and, and win some of those voters you're talking about who sat out in the last election, or maybe made a different choice? I think it's a little too early to tell. Um, and I think part of the problem is that there is this kind of breaking point in the Democratic Party. So we talk about, you know, the success in 2018, but that was from, you know, a lot of people pushing justice Democrats, people who are not a part mm -hmm. of the Democratic establishment. And right now, Joe Biden is leading in, in the polls. So it's hard to tell if, 
his early success means that there's going to be, you know, disaffected voters who don't feel like their voice is going to be heard and they might fall off at some point um, throughout the duration of, of his campaign. And kind of going to your earlier question of should we wor worry about kind of these uh, Trump voters who switched over from Barack Obama or kind of non-voters, maybe working class voters. And I don't think you can take any demographic for granted. I think there are some people you can win on those e economic policies, but you also have to talk about it across race. You also have to be intersectional and talk about race and class issues, which I don't think the Democratic as party establishment has done to the extent that it needs to in order to win for 2020. All right, so I do have to ask you about one candidate because you're from New York City. You live in New York City now. You work in New yes. York City politics. Yes. Is Bill de Blasio running for president? And how's that going to work? I think he officially announced, and he's probably like, whatever the bottom is, he's probably <laughs> second from the bottom. I don't work for the mayoral administration, so yes. I think I'm okay saying yeah. that. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> what do you see about the, the Democratic candidates? Anybody you think? Uh, you can you have to pick one, but are are there candidates that you think have a chance to kind of hold on to the Democratic coalition and maybe appeal to some of the other voters who went across? I'll just say that this primary is is remarkable in terms of the diversity of views, the diversity of backgrounds. We have both a, a, a larger field, but also a more diverse field than ever before. And it really shows the strength of the party at this moment. Uh, so while people have said maybe there are too many candidates, and now that we're well over 20, you know, <laughs> you could make that argument. I, I'm choosing not to because I actually think uh, that this is shows where we are as a party at this moment. And, you know, we we are a diverse country. And finally, and we saw hints of this in 2018, hopefully we'll see more of it in 2020, people want to elect people who represent the diversity of our country. Um, so I think we have a lot of great candidates. Um, but learning I wish from I could piece together, <laughs> like, the perfect Democratic candidate from the ones who are running, right? You find, like, sort of the... The, the policy chops of Elizabeth Warren, and then you get kind of the optimism of Cory Booker, and then you get the badass uh, prosecutorial skills of Kamala Harris, and you know, you get Joe Biden's kind of irreverent self. Like, you could put all these people together and have a really phenomenal candidate, but that's not really the way the world works. But let's talk a little bit more what, about one last thing, and you'll really appreciate this, who worked in the Clinton campaign. What about Russia? They clearly helped Trump in 2016, and they might do so again. Well, what are the Democrats going to do on this topic? And does anybody really care about this Russia question anymore and foreign influence? I mean, if you look at the polling data, you guys had a poll yesterday, and it showed that Democrats are interested in seeing, you know, more investigation and black voters who probably feel that Donald Trump, you know, is a bigot and, and xenophobe, and we should be... Well, black voters don't just think it. Racists think it. <laughs> to kind of quote Andrew Gillum, like, you know, when David Duke endorses you, right. it's not that I'm saying right. I think you're a racist. Absolutely. David Duke thinks right. you're a racist. Right. It's, it's <laughs> almost objective fact at, that, fact at this point. And so there is this kind of need for justice and accountability, which is completely fair. At the same time, we cannot sacrifice, you know, this important issue of, of justice for larger issues that are affecting people who want bold policy solutions, who want people to talk about, you know, the student loan debt crisis, who want people to talk about Medi Medicare for all. So if it's going to be at the expense of those issues, then I think there's going to be a problem. And it didn't work just solely attacking Donald Trump in 2016, and it may not work in 2020. So Rudy Giuliani said that he thought that it was okay to get information from Russia or a foreign power in a campaign. Um, not, whether or not you think that's okay, what do Democrats do to combat that in this election, knowing that it may happen again? I actually think we have to try to remove politics from this issue in general because the the Republicans and, and, and even Democrats to some degree have made this Russia question about Donald Trump. The reality is it's about the integrity and credibility of our elections and our democracy. I mean, here we are talking about 2020. The reality is that if we don't do something to protect our elections, both at, at the state level in terms of the infrastructure, but also against foreign intervention uh, in terms of the counterintelligence uh, investigation that are ongoing, um, it could happen again. And if there is a, cr there could really be a crisis in terms of the credibility of our election going forward if these issues aren't addressed. So the president of the United States says that he, or at least reports are saying, uh, that Mick Mulvaney, the president's chief of staff, refused to even let the Homeland Security uh, Director, sec Cabinet Secretary, host a meeting talking about the Russian interference at the White House because it would get Donald Trump upset. 
I wonder what happens to senators like Rick Scott, who's from Florida, who we know in the Mueller report and from other reports, other reports that the Russians infiltrated Florida's uh, voting booths, Florida's voting um, uh, a county elections board. Um, why isn't a senator like Rick Scott like standing on the steps of the White House yelling at the White House to help, to fix this for the people in his state? If you look at Rick Scott's uh, website today, he's got more things on there about Russia's interference in Venezuela than he has about Russia's interference in the U.S. election. Yeah. Why, aren't, why aren't Republican senators being more excited about this and trying to stop this? There were actually 21 states whose databases and voter rolls were infiltrated and Russia appeared to be testing uh, what they could do in 2016. The problem has been that, like Mulvaney, you know, it has been approached as a, as a Trump issue, right? So Donald Trump would be upset if the Homeland Security did something to secure our election. But why are we putting Trump first? We're exactly. supposed to be putting America first. We, we absolutely should not. And Congress, because Republicans have blocked this, has failed to take any actions to secure our election going forward. So the, the whole investigation, I, I'm concerned, has been framed solely as a political issue or as a partisan issue or even an issue about Trump, when in reality, this is actually about the future of our democracy. And I agree, Senator Scott and, and all senators should be taking action to do more on this issue. And I think if you kind of take a step back and look at why we started this investigation to begin with, it was looking at the meddling of the election that targeted, you know, predominantly people of color. And the Urban and League low, spoke up about that this week, right? Exactly. Yeah. And low income voters. So if the fundamental kind of framework is that we're, we operate in a country that has lobbied for voter suppression, there's no reason for them to necessarily care about this. This is just like kind of another prong in, you know, in the system of voter suppression that has targeted black voters. We also have to be mindful of oppression and how voters are experiencing things when it's not a presidential election. So, you know, I come from, I'm from Atlanta, and we saw the, the types of voter suppression that um, Stacey Abrams experienced against Brian Kemp. We saw it somewhat in Wisconsin and, and throughout the country. And this is just another element of that, but you also have to take care of people's material needs. So even if there is um, some malfeasance, people need to be inspired enough to vote. Okay. Well, thank you, too, for this. Another exciting segment here. we got a pop quiz coming up, so I don't want anybody to go away. What do moms really want for Mother's Day? Next on What America's Thinking. As always, we're wrapping up our show with a little pop quiz. Mother's Day is just around the corner, so we want to know what America's mothers want for their special day. Of the following choices, what tops the Mother's Day wish list? A card, flowers, a gift card, or a massage or spa treatment, or time with myself. Let's start with you. What did you, uh, well, you don't have to tell us exactly what you got from your mother because okay. we don't want to spoil the surprise. Yes. But what, what, what would you say most people in America would say about what the preference is for mothers? I would say the last one. The last a one. A massage, a spa, especially in these times, uh -huh. women need to relax <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I got you. And what would you say America would, uh, would choose? Probably flowers because okay. it's it's uh, you know I think probably what most people get their mother yeah. though though I personally would vote for the spa. So see this is <laughs> this is helpful because a lot of us guys here and there are a bunch of guys who are back here behind these cameras who are all taking notes about what to do for wives moms you know significance and uh, let's see what the rest of the people say here. Moms across the nation have spoken and we have a tie. For Mother's Day moms want a massage or spa treatment and flowers alike. They both had 9% of the vote. That's according to a new YouGov survey. Following close behind is a Mother's Day card and time with myself. So um, that seems to comport with what it is you guys were just saying. Yeah, representative sample here. <laughs> yeah, it's a representative sample. Because, you know, you know, it's easy to go for the flowers because the flowers are probably easy to do. But it's more helpful to see, like, oh, well, maybe that's not exactly what it is the mom in your life might want, right? Yeah, and it only lasts a few days. That's the other thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, less but. things to care for, I guess. Yeah. And then the last option was time for, time themselves. for themselves. Like, yes. just nobody around. Which, yes. which is That's combined awkward. with the spa, yeah. right? Because isn't the spa some time with yourself? I would have thought that would win, but, you know, here we are. Like you said, you could do both. Or, you know, maybe you could do all of them. 
All of the above. Yeah. That would be my choice. If the that was an option, option. <laughs> then that might have won. <laughs> all right. I'm, I'm complicating the world for everybody who's watching. <laughs> Ranked got... choice voting. Let's do <laughs> yes, it. Yes, exactly. Let's do a little bit of all of them. That's all we have for you today. As always, we'll be back next week for more news on public opinion. I'm Jamal Simmons. You can find more of my work here on Hill TV or at Jamal Simmons on Twitter or at Real Jamal Simmons on Facebook and Instagram. Now we all know what America's thinking. Have a good weekend and happy Mother's Day to all those moms, grandmoms, godmoms, whatever kind of mama you are, happy Mother's Day.